Next up, we have Cayman McKay. Welcome, Cayman. Cayman is the director and international partner of Cundall. And Cayman has nearly 30 years' experience consulting in environmental responsive and sustainable development design, including numerous justice and correctional facilities. Within the breadth of his experience are projects which enjoy both national and international praise for innovative design, as energy efficiency, occupant comfort, and reduced environmental impact including many healthcare developments such as the Aubrey Wodong Regional Cancer Centre and also the Royal Children's Hospital. Key to his success in achieving real sustainable outcomes has been his multidiscipline, operational, climatically responsive and open approach to improving the sustainable design response of buildings. Sustainable design inspires him as it leads to good design outcomes in respect of function, form, performance, occupant satisfaction, and future proofing. Please join me in welcoming Cayman. Thank you. I think I'll ever get used to talking about my own fashion. Sorry. Um, uh, I'm just going to give a, an overview of the sort of health and well being side of the equation when it comes to sustainability. Um, so, I'll also give a bit of brief introduction to Cumble. Um, we're actually an international business, 21 offices around the world. Uh, we're growing in 1950 the last year, um, and we're also quite importantly in relation to today, I suppose we are one planet certified consultancy practice, uh, first in the world to do so. So we take our issues of sustainability seriously and apply them to our operations uh, day to day. We do the last range of multi-physical engineering. I suppose of particular interest is in sustainable design consulting and also the environmental benchmark and ratings which are starting to actually be used increasingly um, on projects including healthcare. So um, why design for health and well-being? Well, it becomes pretty obvious when you look at finances. Um, people are the greatest cost and therefore if they're happy and healthy. Uh, you're likely to actually um, reap the financial rewards thereon. Um, if you want to try and reduce your energy consumption by significantly, you can find yourself actually getting quite a low, unfortunately, ultimate cost benefit. Um, you can obviously reduce your carbon emissions and all those things, but you don't necessarily necessarily tackle the same issues financially. Um, 30 billion uh, is lost on productivity from, from sickness. Um, there's also Working days lost of 92 million in Australia. And um, $3,230 is the average amount for employee and business lose absenteeism. So the actual numbers start to actually stack up quite quickly that um, the health and well-being of your staff um, and people within it, in, in your buildings are actually really important and needs to be addressed. Um, what's all, uh, so it's, Seven in ten are, 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 are overweight and obese. I did my old health check this week. I was told I need to lose some weight, so there's a focus on me. Um, one in two women and one in four children. So, uh, quite significant. Um, one in 20 eats enough food and veg. One in five suffers from hay fever. Uh, unfortunately, I came to Australia and now I have hay fever. I didn't have it before. Uh, plain foods are a killer for me. Um, Australia get, don't get enough exercise, and we also um, one in 20 is like diabetes, and that portion is growing. Uh, three out of 20 are smokers, uh, one in six have long term alcohol issues, uh, and one in six also suffer from mental health and uh, behavioral problems. So, the case for you know, addressing health and well being is quite high. From a healthcare environment, um, you also have some research. So you've got research is based on patients who are in sunny rooms with reduced length of stay of 3.3 days compared to dull rooms in 2.3 uh, or 2, 3 days dull rooms in 2.3 in sunny rooms. So the economics of that are actually quite tremendous. Um, so the issues of access to daylight, views out, cleanliness, um, acoustic environment all will affect um, how we staff and your patients actually um, uh, sort of appreciate the spaces they're in and actually hopefully get healthier quicker. Um, so it's not just about the patients, the nurses as well benefit from the access to daylight which should be used to outside. Um, it's actually quite important. 
um, ergonomic, practical, flexible, personal space, and privacy and security, all awesome facts in there. And they're all part and parcel of some of the issues that you actually need to deal with from a health and well-being perspective. Um, so it's not just about temperature control. The benefits of a healthy building, um, physical, mental, and social health improvements, reduced absenteeism, reduced presenteeism, which is the idea that you actually are, you shouldn't really be here, but you are because you feel you need to be. Um, so you're not as effective as you should. Uh, your concentration and learning, ha happiness and morale, staff retention and productivity all get affected by um, health and well-being, healthy buildings. In a healthcare environment, you've got obviously the creation of cameras, uh, well-being, infection control, and benefit from um, staff feel actually more respected and valued. Staff seen as individuals rather than uh, a, a collective group, better treatment of both staff and patients, uh, and overall better experience, less stress. Um, it also tackles the issue of climate risk management as well. Um, you can have improved recovery, recovery, recovery uh, increased uh, patient throughput, um, reduced staff sickness, staff retention, improved performance, and so on. So it actually starts to actually make a lot of sense as to why and how you should be doing it. There are a few um, so our rating tools that exist to actually benchmark performance. I'm not going to spend too long on these because there are chatting themselves. And the Green Star has been applied in a number of hospitals um, around the country. Uh, but it's holistic and it doesn't just deal with, with um, health and well-being. It covers a lot of other areas as well. But from my health and well-being, I have comfort perspective about acoustic, indoor air quality, lighting, pollutants, uh, oral tackle. Um, we've also got Neighbours IE, which basically allows you to understand the relative effectiveness of your designs in terms of actually its ability to actually maintain the conditions you're looking for. Um, the combination of an occupant survey, um, a site visit, some spot measurements, um, and then the monitoring, which is optional to actually allow you to actually understand whether the actions you take are, are actually addressing things as you, as you want them to. You've also got the recent, uh, I say recent, probably been around about two and a half years in Australia, uh, the well building standard, um, which basically focuses on physical, mental, and social health. Um, it's sort of all about the occupant. Uh, it's based on research and science of human health and body systems. Um, it's, it's a success of design, construction, and, and it's also quite unusual for some of the environment rating tools. It actually comes back and tests things to see if it's actually achieved what you set out. It's not just relying on out of the report or a document that's been produced. Um, so the performance verification is a very big differentiator. It's there. Um, like a lot of rating tools, you'll see here, the start of version one has, um, has seven um, areas of focus. It's now it's expanded to 10. Um, so it's actually growing as, as people are using it and actually engaging with it and actually um, separating things out to focus more things on, on issues of mind and community, et cetera, that are there as well. And then you've got what is FitWell, which is like the well building standard, a light version of it, which is basically a low, uh, an earlier, um, so it's an easier way of actually engaging with the process without necessarily going to the full uh, extent of actually getting the, the well building standard. They're not linked to sort of different types of tools, which basically try to actually give you the same how well you're doing from a health and well being perspective. The designing healthy buildings. So using the well building standards, and this was like, was like uh, a way of explaining and going through things. Um, the well concept, the first one is air, um, so it's actually about the access to, to fresh air. Um, ventilation effectiveness, how well the extra air, air is, is mixing and moving through your space. Air filtration, air filtration. Um, healthy building entrances, not necessarily ideal for, for a hospital, but revolving doors actually have quite a large impact on, on commercial buildings in terms of bringing dust and dirt in. Um, also, actually, improving energy efficiency quite significantly as well. Um, there's also air quality monitoring uh, and cleanable surface. So, all focusing on trying to actually improve the air quality inside of the building. You've got water. Um, now, quite importantly here, it actually um, comes from a situation where you need to actually test your water. Um, just to ensure that you're actually, the water you're actually bringing into your building is actually safe. Uh, for use. Uh, when we did this for our London office, we realized that by virtue of where the, the office was, there was an awful lot of lead piping around and we were having to treat the water for our own staff, even though that otherwise we wouldn't have had to do so. Um, so, so you need to think of that. Uh, so it's actually also trying to make sure that 
the ability to for people to actually uh, drink water is readily available to for them uh, as well. Nourishment. So it starts getting into what I would say the areas that we traditionally would not go straight into or probably wouldn't touch on. Um, this is looking at healthy food options. Um, it even design, helps you design the size and shape and form of your sink to ensure that there's no water splash and spill, which um, to a certain degree is known from a healthcare perspective, but from an office and, and, and kind of operation, uh, administration perspective, it's not there. Food storage and preparation, uh, nutritional mess messaging. So you're starting to actually get people to understand the decisions that they're making about what they're eating. Um, uh, so actually creating spaces that actually also people can actually just step, step away. So not even at the desk, actually create a space that people actually quite enjoy being asked to actually um, appreciate um, having that break as much as having the lunch. Um, and also there's a focus on the opportunities that might exist from a, an on-site food production perspective. So light, um, quite a, very important in terms of glare control, daylight access, um, looking at the surface design for finishes, so you're actually looking at the, the colors and finishes you're using to actually promote, promote daylight distribution and also more effective lighting uh, illumination. Uh, it also starts talking into things like circadian lighting design. So we're actually having a lighting change over the day to reflect what's actually happening outside. Um, so it's actually recognizing through research that there's actually a need to, to, uh, to engage people with what's actually happening outside. Um, artificially lit spaces can actually detach you from um, um, so the environment outside. So circadian lighting is quite a big focus. So it stimulates alertness during the day. Mimics the natural circadian rhythms. Um, so it creates a, a more alert space um, and also replicates what's, what's happening outside. Um, it's also color, color sensitive. We actually change the colors as well. So it actually uh, encourages you, hopefully, also encourages you to go home too, not just to stay there all day, uh, which artificial lighting sometimes fit, gives you to do. Um, it also started to change the way lighting is being done. Um, so you're starting looking at suspended lighting over workstations, up lighting, wall washing, so you don't have dark ceilings to actually get more general brightness in your space. Um, interesting enough, this whole focus has also started to get solutions which are actually more energy efficient as well. Um, these two projects here are, are, are offices in, in the UK, have got down to two and a half watts per meter squared, which is a less than half of what the current uh, BCA is, is calling for from an energy efficiency perspective. So there actually is not benefits at the same time. There's also, I suppose, from a healthcare perspective, this is a um, uh, award designed from a PPP in the UK, uh, where they use modular, uh, modular design uh, for an existing hospital to try and basically um, re, re uh, the existing hospital. Um, and they've actually introduced a lighting system so they can actually move through the various stages of the day. Um, so you've got your morning, your midday, you've got your examination where the lights are actually now focusing on the, the bed itself to actually eliminate from a uh, uh, medical examination perspective to an evening and ultimately the night. Um, so you try to actually work through that rhythms um, again as well, recognizing that uh, the research is that patients who are actually connected more to what's happening outside will actually heal. Um, you've also got the fitness, um, so the curious fitness regulation. The idea that staircase is not hidden away, it's actually promoted to be where it has to encourage people to use it. Um, physical activities, um, you've even got, um, uh, you know, seen some images of, of, of um, wheels, people actually working desks as they're running around at the same time. Um, but now uh, it's a different mental picture. Um, industrial facilities, repair stations to encourage people to use uh, sustainable transport options uh, while they're running at uh, lunchtime. Um, active furnishing, so you've got stand desks, treadmill desks, etc., all starting to find their way into, into workplaces. So people can actually be sitting at a desk and then part of the way through the day they can stand up and actually continue to work, just actually move them, just continue to move themselves. Um, we started introducing them to our own office, and now about 60% of the desks have as well as people start to actually engage and start using them more effectively. Comfort, obviously ergonomics is important. Um, thermal comfort in terms of mechanical design, uh, obviously thermal comfort for architectural design, so passive design, orientation, window shaping, insulation, etc. The new BCA is going to challenge a few architects, unfortunately, with the 
amount of glass that will be allowable in buildings. Um, acoustics as well, very important in terms of um, um, external noise, building noise, reverberation, and privacy. You start even getting some sound masking being introduced into spaces to actually um, uh, sort of hide certain noise, but not the noise that might actually be seen as irritating, not just a catered general background noise level that actually uh, achieves acoustic comfort for people um, as well. Uh, mind, so beauty and design. So yes, they have a, a credit and wealth of beauty and design. You sort of describe what you've done to introduce beauty to your design response. Um, adaptable spaces uh, for collaboration, quiet zones. Um, so just try to create a space that people actually can move around. I always think of memory on the Royal Children's where uh, Bill Arthur, the architect, encouraged the idea of the family rooms where people could actually create a space which just wasn't as clinical, was more family focused, and they can actually break away from uh, what was otherwise a very stressful place to be. Um, you also started to see biophilia, so plants, et cetera, being brought into buildings. Um, and audio soundscaping. Uh, be careful though, um, we've, um, where we are in the city, there's a, a bar next to us, use birds there to actually create the sense that you're outside and you know you're in the language. Um, but, but equally, um, uh, we did test this in our own offices and we brought in the sound of running water, which might sound nice, except everyone's running to the toilet every five minutes. So uh, be careful as to how you, what, what you do. Um, and the biophilia as well. Um, Stretch images, but you basically start to see that the idea of bringing nature back into the in, inside uh, the building, uh, unlike the thing was locked last night, actually fake windows, which is uh, hopefully not, we're not moving in that direction. Uh, but the idea of actually bringing those plants in, etc., to help. Um, you're also starting to see a large um, move on innovation in response to this um, as part of our own development of our, our well-being rated office building in Melbourne, as in London, we actually used to develop a sensor, which we're using. We've got um, um, virtual acoustics. We're also getting into quality of the map, so we're using technology to allow us to assess, assess things. So you can test things, see how they go. You can see how the fit-out works, look at the various values and benefits. You can actually leave technology behind to actually understand if things are working as they should. Um, and so some results just quickly on this the building in our uh, fit out in London. So this is the baby space for people to have their lunch in a more detached and uh, more pleasant environment. Um, these are before and after results for various issues from in terms of sense of community, enjoyment, and environment. We saw a marked increase in, in that. We also saw uh, uh, workplace culture shift as well. So we were able to march and that go through. And it had a less than a six month payback period in terms of actually sure define the, the numbers. So um, uh, it does actually make economic sense as well. So very sorry. So design for health and well-being is a good is, is actually a good design. Uh, designed to, to code or standards does not necessarily guarantee a healthy in, indoor environment. Uh, coordinated approach is needed, so it needs to be working with the architect, service engineers, the acoustics consultant, the ESD consultant to be working together. Um, there are some industry tools. You need to be careful as to how you apply them. A rating tool doesn't necessarily get you what you want, but elements of it does, so you might want to pick and choose what you want to achieve. Uh, and there are some technologies around in terms of neighbors and environment, in the environment, high incentives that allow you to test and monitor and tune the buildings that they should be. And that's it. Thank you, Cayman. Um, uh, any questions for Cayman? Absolutely. So, um, um, on the VCC, which we were involved with, there were certain plants that were absolutely not allowed, uh, even soils where we couldn't have soils, etc. So, I think it's a it's a case by case scenario. Uh, I suppose one of the things I was trying to reinforce there is a hospital isn't just there's a lot of administrative research in other spaces that are in a hospital that aren't necessarily just patient focused. So there are spaces where it can be applied and used quite, quite well, but it's not necessarily appropriate in every location for any case. No. Question at the back, yep. It's basically we're trying to use some of the analysis work we've been doing to try and 
um, sort of take on board all the things that we now learned about daylight, temperature control, etc., and actually bring them together into a form that we can actually look at the relative strength and weakness of layouts in first various spaces. Um, it's, it's, I suppose at the, at the, we're at the starting point of that. Um, it's not necessarily robust enough yet to take any particular functional space. So we've probably focused more primarily on the commercial environment at the moment. Um, so it's actually using sort of the research and development that's actually happening and actually humanizing it to allow people to understand the relative strength of things. Um, so yes, it, it is, it's a service we're starting to actually offer basically and provide people with some assistance with. Um, well, I suppose there's, there's, it's, it's been like, the, uh, as you said yourself, is choosing the right system for the particular, particular environment is, is, is critical. Not all the systems work. I think that, um, when I first came to Australia, um, the chill beam technology launched itself in the marketplace and it seemed to be a situation where every building had to have them. I even they weren't necessarily the right solution. Um, so you need to be careful about the solutions. You're starting to see the news uh, aging ceilings, for example, in healthcare environments in, in Europe. And um, they use um, active tube beams, passive tube beams as well. You do need to be careful about the infection control side of things as well, because the cleaning, so the radiant ceiling can actually make common sense, because they're actually easy to clean. Um, um, so you are actually seeing that, but it's actually focusing on the comfort quality that you're looking for, and also the ease of cleaning and infection control, those sorts of things that we factor into it, into it. And the type of grill you use for air distribution as well, is also quite important. I think you are because people are starting to focus on um, the cause of the issue of health and well-being is a way to focus on what, what am I experiencing yeah. and people are expecting um, what they uh, certain environments. So you're starting to get people looking at things more critically. Um, so you're starting to see it's more important. The problem would be is, is that a lot of doing a lot of the analysis work has been um, it's, it's been taken away at the same time. The cost of doing an analysis earlier in the design piece has actually been hindering some of that. So the question of actually doing some sample modeling and intelligent interpretation of that to move forward. A best example for this is, is uh, I remember when I was working in the UK, um, there was a expected uh, office building built and, it, and they were trying to lease it and rent it. Uh, what they found was you could actually hear the water running through the pipeline. So people were walking around and they were actually, because it was an empty space, they were actually hearing noises they wouldn't otherwise hear. So they actually introduced some sound masking to actually just create a background noise model inside the space that was more representative of how the space actually would be occupied. And then they actually were able to rent and, and lease the space much more readily. So the case of actually getting rid of certain noises and actually masking them so you don't, they don't actually go any them effectively. Um, it's not necessarily making it louder and louder so you can't hear anything, it's more about just creating a general level of noise inside the space that's more uniform and more representative of the space. Yes. Yeah. 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 Or, or the distribution of that sound depending on how it can be what they're trying to achieve. Thank you, Cameron. Um, so the holistic building design. Um, and also healthy buildings assisting the breeding of healthy people. So thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. We have a small uh, token of appreciation there. <laughs> we'll now break for morning tea to also get some uh, daylight exposure.